Welcome back to another episode of the Hit Podcast. My name is James Layton, CEO and founder of Anderson James. This is the podcast where I bring you real life stories from some of the most interesting leaders of our sector. Today, I was delighted to be joined by Kate Davies, Chief Executive at Notting Hill Genesis. We talk at length around Kate's journey through the housing industry over the last 30 years, what she's seen change, and how the growth of Notting Hill Genesis over the last 18 years. We also talk around how Kate's recently been awarded a CBE in the Queen's Honours list, and also look at the future for Notting Hill now Kate has stepped down under the new leadership of Patrick Franco. I know you're going to enjoy this episode, and if you do like it, I'd ask that you like and subscribe. Hi, Kate. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, James. Thank you for having me. No worries. Um, we're just talking about the weather. It's actually sunny in Manchester for once today, so it's nice. It is nice. It's very sunny in London, although it was tipping it down when I tried to walk into work today, <laughs> but I, I jumped on the bus instead. Nice. And as as I always like to do, uh, I, I, I've done you an introduction before the episode, but just for the listeners, could you just give us an introduction to yourself, please? Uh, yes. So um, I work in a housing association called Notting Hill Genesis and I've been here for 18 years Um, and I'm getting towards the end of my career in housing associations and I'm going to leave um, early next year in order to do something else with my life. I've been in the housing sector for 30 odd years, 32 or three years I think and uh, I absolutely love it and I think it's a fantastic sector to be in. Amazing. And, and, and I always like to ask this, but how did you get into housing? Like, you know, most people say they fell into housing. How did you end up getting into housing? Well, it's quite intriguing. I used to work in a family planning clinic in uh, Brixton. And the uh, girl I worked with, she was the counsellor, and she, her husband worked in a housing association. And uh, she said, oh, my uh, husband's looking for an administrator. And my job was a, a maternity cover. So I was looking for a job, so I went for it. That's it. There was no, I knew nothing about housing associations. It was just through a friend. And I got that job and I really like fell in love with what I was doing and I never looked back. So yes, yeah, started off as an administrator in a development team, in other words, on the building side. And I went from there to get a job on the development side. And then later I branched out to housing management as well. Amazing. And I mean, at that time, what, what is different today in housing to what, what it was like mm-hmm. back then, would you say? What's changed in that period? Well, the most amazing thing is when I started, if you wanted to build new homes, which is what we were doing, the government paid 100% of that as grant. Mm. So you even if you spent more than you were supposed to, they'd pay you like 105% or 110%. It is an incredible thought now. Because in Notting Hill today, only 10% of the money we put into new building of homes comes from the government. The rest we make through our own activities. So that is a huge change, huge. And it really explains why housing associations are very different. They're much bigger today. They're much more commercial. They're much more driven by market trends. Although we're still charities, still fundamentally charities, uh, the um, whole way that we have to make money from commercial activity to subsidize the social uh, purpose of the organization it needs different skills and different approaches than perhaps we had when I started out. Yeah, no, exactly. And I'd like to dig into that in a little while. But as we sit here today, just give us the helicopter view of uh, Notting Hill as we as we stand here today. So um, it's intriguing because I was looking back to how big it was when I started because I've actually forgotten. And it had a mil- hundred million pound turnover when I started and it's now just short of a billion. So in terms of, uh, you know, it's grown tenfold in that time. We had 14,000 homes when I started. We now got 67,000 homes. Uh, we made a profit in my first year of six million, which is pretty poor. And now we're making over 100 million, maybe 120, 130 million pounds a year of profit that enables us to fund that social activity that used to be paid for 100 percent by the taxpayer. Mm. So that's the scale of growth. I don't know whether whether that's considered fast growth or slow growth, but it is very significant growth and it's pretty organic. Um, You know, the value of the real estate that we have as, as Notting Hill Genesis is 21 billion pounds of real estate and uh, 
you know, these are big businesses. And unless you know about them, you, you wouldn't necessarily know that they even exist. They're a yeah. bit of a sort of quiet, a sleeping giant, if you like, in the economy. Yeah, if, if if that business was in the private sector, everyone mm. would be wax lyrical about how much growth you'd had and, and the yes. assets on the balance sheet and stuff. Well, but they'd want the... some shares, wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah, they would, they would. <laughs> um, so let, take, take me back then, 18 years, what what did you inherit? You said 14,000 properties, but what did the organisation look like then? And talk us through some of the journey and some of the milestones that have happened to get to 750 to a billion pound turnover. Yeah, so... Um... We were in six boroughs in London mm -hmm. uh, when I started, and now we're in 32. There's 33. We don't have anything in the city of London, but we have stock in all of the boroughs of London. We're a little bit outside London as well, but not so. it's not so important to us. London is still our key area of work, and it means we've got quite a lot of specialism in London. We know the boroughs. We know the politics. We know the issues in London, which are quite specific. The basic unaffordability of housing in any part of London is a critical issue for the economy of London and the people of London. So what have we done since I've been here? Well, when I started, we didn't do any homes for outright sale because we didn't need to so much. You know, a lot of our work was funded by government grant. So we started off with a uh, build homes for sale and that has been successful and we've carried on doing that. So every year we build about a third of what we build is for outright sale. And that is purely a profitable activity um, that we then use those uh, profits to subsidize the social housing. But to go into becoming a land-led private sector property developer was new for us. Yep. And we've learned it by doing it. And now we're quite good at it. Uh, the returns we make are comparable to the Barclays and Barretts of this world. Secondly, we have set up a market rent business while I've been here. I was there when we bought our first little block of 12 homes, and we now have um, a, a market rent business uh, of where the property is worth over a billion pounds. Uh, we've borrowed money for folio. We've uh, built and developed homes and um, we have a really sort of wide variety of types of homes but the private rented sector was a new sector for us and now that's that's very successful and a profitable um, part of our business as well as somewhere that's offering a really good quality offer and we get four or five out of five on trust pilot for what we do in folio so that's very pleasing i think the other thing that we designed which is new was a uh, an end-to-end -end housing management system that we call WorkWise. Mm -hmm. um, we've designed that ourselves and it enables tenants, other customers to get all their needs met remotely. They don't have to phone us up. They don't have to come into an office. They can order everything themselves uh, through their phone or through their computer. And it's, um, it's very good for collecting money. 80% or more of our customers use it to pay their rent. And then with repairs and so on, that's about 60% of people are using it for repairs. Um, so that was another big thing. There is quite a lot of creativity on the finance side as well. Um, I mean, we've got green bond and a good ESG strategy now. But on um, we were able to use our uh, money that we make on our on our for profit part of our business, which is shared ownership, we were able to use the profits of that to invest in buying homes for people rather than paying it to the tax man. So we've been able to use gift aid to create a portfolio of about 500 homes that we've built with no grant at all, absolutely no grant, and we offer them at 20% discount to the market price, particularly to key workers. And during COVID, we were particularly focusing it on, on NHS workers and other sort of homes for heroes idea um, and there are other things that we have done uh, quite creative on the finance side but these are all things that it's been a real privilege for me working in a business that is um, you know so dynamic and so uh, with such a strong asset base that we've been able to incubate new businesses within it if you like yeah. and uh, launch them and for them to be successful and people who work here you know, we've learned as we've done it, like any business, like your business, like anybody else's business, you try it sometimes and sometimes it works and it's fantastic. And that's, mm. we've had lots of good experiences like that. Amazing. And 
I, I can't even begin to where to start, but but clearly running an organisation as it was then versus now, how, how has your leadership journey come about? Because clearly I bet you've had to evolve your style and the way you operate over that time. But how have you made sure you keep evolving as a leader in that period? Yeah, it's a very, very interesting question. And soul searching is required at this moment because an immature person is often an immature leader. And I know in my career, I've been given opportunities to take up senior management roles and take leadership roles. And I didn't really know how to do it. I think it's a bit like being a parent. You end up with this baby (laughs) and you sort of try your best. And sometimes you might be a bit too strict and sometimes you might be a bit too liberal and you make a complete mess of it. And but thankfully, you can have a second or a third one and you have another go at it. (laughs) And actually, they grow up and they forgive you your mistakes, which is absolutely beautiful of them. And I think it's the bit the same, that management and leadership is not something you're really born with. You do have to learn. And all learning is to do with making mistakes and being full of remorse and, you know, reflecting on what you did and then trying to do it better next time. So... Clearly, I feel I'm a better manager now in my 60s than I was in my 20s and 30s. Yeah, I think you're nodding your head on that as well. (laughs) And, um, you know, lots of things like I thought I knew best. I really did. And I found I could, you know, we'd be looking at a problem and my brain would go to an answer quite quickly. And I thought, well, I'll share this with the group. You know, why do I need to sit around (laughs) discussing this for half an hour? I'll tell them the answer. Right now, I've realized over time that is pretty stupid. It's much, much better. Firstly, the group looking at it together, there are much more brains working on it. So instead of one brain, you've got eight or nine brains working on it. And they'll all look at it from a slightly different point of view. So your solution will be much more multifaceted. Also, if they've had a part in designing it, they're going to be much more bought in than some dictator telling them what they've got (laughs) to do. So that's just one example of things that I have learned. Um, But there's many, many. And, uh, you know, basically trusting people to get on and do the job. They won't necessarily do it the same as you. Um, Other things like um, public speaking, you know, I'm quite a good public speaker. So I would grab all the public speaking (laughs) invitations for myself. I think, well, I can (laughs) I can do that well. And of course, no one else is going to learn to be a good public speaker unless they get practice. So you have to support other people to get the skills. So I guess I was pretty arrogant. And I came through that and learned that, you know, like everybody else, I just make mistakes after mistakes, and you have to uh, learn from them. So I hope I've become more reflective, more trusting, more uh, interested in developing other people. And it uh, just as I'm talking, sorry, you're going to find it hard to get your questions in at this. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, don't so worry. This is good. <laughs> when um, when I was a parent to my kids, I didn't know what I was doing, as I said. But when you become a grandparent, you could have the uh, wish to tell your children how to do the parenting. Yeah? It's it's inevitable. My mother had a lot of advice for me. Some of it good, and some of it not. But I have really stood back and let my kids make their own minds up about baby led weaning and breastfeeding for for years you know there's lots of things they've they've done that uh, I didn't do but um it's not wrong at all it's just different and so um I believe I've learned as being a grandparent to step back and allow other people to do it their own way and that's what I've learned at work as well that if you want your people to be good, you have to give them the experience of the all-round experience of running the company. In Notting Hill Genesis, we had a, a scheme, and it's still there, is that we've divided the businesses up into smaller businesses. So Lizzie Stevens runs Folio. Pippa uh, runs our leasehold. Um, uh, um, Robert runs our care and support. So yeah. each business, um, Amy runs our temporary housing. You know, we we divide them up and give people that business. They're responsible for the PL, They're responsible for the delivering the budget. They're responsible for choosing who they employ and so on. And they're held accountable for delivering the outcomes that we agree with them. They show the business plan to the leadership once a year and they come back and report on their yeah. achievements. And it's been a fantastic way for people to get the opportunity to lead themselves in their own way in a safe environment. It's been great. 
Yeah, and I know some of your team, and I, and I know that they're sad that you're coming to the end of your career at NHG, but what what have you instilled in that team? Because clearly it's evolved over time. Naturally, the structure's much bigger. I mean, how many people were you then, and how many people are you now that you lead? It must be. Oh, well, it's 2,500 now. Wow. I think there was a couple of hundred when I started. I mean, it's really big. There's a lot of people, and I don't know everybody's names anymore. When it's 200, no. 250, you do know everybody's names. But I still try to, to know people individually and talk to them individually. Um, having said that, I more concentrate on the leadership layers because those are the, the people we're, we're relying on. And um, sorry, I've even forgotten your question, but... Um, sorry, it's just how you've you... developed great teams because clearly you've yes. built up a very loyal team and a very good leadership team. But how yes. have you done that? Because is it an evolution or is it something that you just have to pick the right complementary skills over time? How have you done it? Yeah, I think that's right. I don't know if I have any skills in great measure, but what I do think has been very important to me is the ability to pick good people. Hmm. Um, and that is, it's a slightly instinctive thing. I mean, you're a headhunter, you know about this. You can have all these charts and give people marks out of 10, but there is something you, as, a, as an animal, as a human, you can feel whether somebody is quite right. And one thing, I mean, I've got a lot of views about this because I think recruitment is the most important thing <laughs> to being successful, right? Um, but I think it is... I've met quite a lot of people who do a great interview, but they're not a great member of staff. And I think choosing people on the base of an interview can be very risky. And often some of my very best people, probably the whole, everybody on my executive, I don't think they're really brilliant at interviews. Most of them are brilliant at delivery. But yeah. in interviews, they're a little bit modest. They're a little bit nervous. They're a little bit self-effacing. They have some humility to them. They are not very smooth. They're very you know nice decent people but they aren't necessarily flashy and yep. those are the people i've found have worked well for me people who enjoy being in a team aren't necessarily a prima donna and so my best staff um i have uh you know grown internally yep. i i really believe in that that if people come in sort of young enthusiastic and they want to make their career here we try our very best to give them an opportunity to go as far as they can, as fast as they can. So we have somebody on on the executive who's in her thirties, and you know she's extremely competent, um, and she's been with the company already since she was in her twenties, early twenties. I think she was about twenty seven when she was a senior director, and. Um, you don't have to be long in the tooth to be good. If you've got what it takes, we can give people promotion opportunities. And I'd rather have someone I've seen in the wet, and they may have some faults, they may not be perfect, but mm. I know I can rely on them, trust them, build them, that they are loyal, that they work for us, they, they're they motivated. And uh, you do need fresh blood, I'm not against it at all, but... Um, having the core of your people, I think 70 to 80% of our people have been recruited internally and come up to the, up to the top through that way. Um, and you know, you know, they're reliable. Reliability yeah. is an under, under estimated quality. A hundred percent. And, and I agree with you on the interview thing. I think it's designed, I don't know if we'll ever change it in my lifetime, but I think it's designed in a way to suit the people with the extroverted personality that know exactly what to say at the right moment, but it's not necessarily designed in a way to bring out the right competencies that you're looking for in that person in the role itself. I totally um, agree. I also think it can be a bit discriminatory. You know, people have been to a private school and have, you know, been in a debating society at university. Those people probably are going to be better in an interview than someone who's perhaps, you know, come come up through doing things. Yeah, and, yeah, no, I agree. You know, it, can, it can discriminate against working class people or people from ethnic groups or women. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and we'll come back to that because I'm really keen to in, explore that. But the, the one other question I had on the scale from... 200 staff to two and a half thousand is mm. how do you keep the culture consistent so when you're 200 people like you say you know everyone's name you can put your arms around mm. the business somewhat <laughs> when you're two and a half thousand you've got to rely on other people to keep spreading that cultural values and the behaviors that you want to see but how do you do that as a leader in such a big organization 
I think it, that's a very, again, another very interesting question. But in a way, that's what management is and leadership is working through other people, isn't it? So you can't do it all yourself. You, you know yourself from building up a small business. At first, you try to do everything yourself. Yeah. And then actually, you have to at some point let go and trust other people to do it. And it's the same in a big organization, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you, you just have to believe that the people who work for you can do it as well as you can. And um, I don't think the culture is exactly the same in all parts of our business at all, actually. The, the people who work in care and support are different from the people who work in development. But that's appropriate because they're doing mm. different kind of work. And the values are important. And, and I would say the values and culture of both of those teams in my organization is very good because they have very good leaders. Um, but it's not the same, and you couldn't easily pick one and put it in the other. No. You know, they wouldn't necessarily thrive. Um, and you can't have. And we're not automatons. You know, we got. We don't expect people to behave like we're in North Korea. Um, yeah. You know, they have to do it in their own way, and each each bit has its own flavour. But it's being true to the core ideas. I don't think the culture should be too complicated. You know, you need to keep it quite a simple message of what it's about, and then everybody can take that and make it work for them yeah it's a framework isn't it and people it can is. have a slightly different flavor but it has to work within the overall framework but exactly i think that you can, you talked about diversity and i've listened to loads of your previous interviews and done some research and i know you're a massive ambassador for diversity as a person but one thing that i've been battling with for the last three or four years is about how do we change especially at board and executive level the diversity metrics that we seem to have a big push at parts, you know, when we did Black Lives Matter, we had a big push and, 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 and then these things seem to pale into insignificance two, three years later. But what do we need to do to talk, sort of fix those unconscious biases that we all have, let's be honest, um, they're within us. Um, but what do we do to start to really diversify boards around the country in housing? Yeah, it's intriguing because two of our biggest uh, advocates on the board are white middle-class men who probably um i mean probably now they wouldn't vote tory but they probably have voted tory uh in their lives and those two guys have become such great advocates for diversity and that has made a real difference if you just leave it to the women and the black people to do it it's not going to happen hmm. you have to get the buy-in of everybody so i think um we just worked with those two guys, my chairman and my Sid, and they're very, very intelligent people and they understood the value of it. So we started with the fact that, do you realize the majority of people we house in London are from black and minority ethnic backgrounds? Yes, we understood that. And do you understand that the majority of our staff, 65, 70% of our staff are from black and minority ethnic backgrounds? Mm. Yes, I think we understood that too, Kate. Well. Do you think it seems right that the board is all white? Not that it was actually at that moment. Yeah, yeah but, of course. But you know, you. don't you think that we should at least reflect the people that we serve and the people who work for us? And they said, yes, so let's do it, you know? And it was quite an easy, easy win. So as soon as we had any turnover, we said we need to find a black or minority ethnic person or a woman, or whatever we, you know, to try and balance the numbers. Uh, let's go and look for that hmm. quality. So we spoke to headhunters like your your firm and others and said, uh, we want to find, say, you know, a black person for this role. And they go, well, you're not allowed to do that, Kate. And I go, well, that's what we're paying you for. Yeah. Um, we, this is what we want. I said, actually, I don't want to waste the time of old white guys because we've got enough of them on the board. Mm -hmm. and, and don't, you know, if you go chatting them up, you're just asking them to waste their time filling in an application form. We do really want a, a black people into this role and they go well would you consider a really really good white person I said no actually I want a really <laughs> I want a really really good black person can you go yeah. out and find me an all black shortlist and they like I say people go oh that's not allowed and I said well let me worry about that yeah, yeah let yeah. me worry about that because what our thought is our organization needed to be more diverse and therefore we needed to balance it up so that's what we've done we've we've when we're working with headhunters, head we've asked them specifically to look for uh, black people or women for a role 
Um, and there are a few roles when you've got the good balance, you're not fussed and you'll take anybody, including white men. I mean, we promote lots of good white men in our organization. There's no, there's no way they're being held back, but most of them fight their own corner very, very well. And they've got yeah. lots of reasons why they'll get appointed or selected. And they don't necessarily need that helping hand. Having said that, there are some a uh, lot of white guys in this organization who've had, you know, a, a background that is not privileged, who have come from ordinary working class homes, maybe come from single parent families, maybe have had uh, health issues, maybe had mental health. Those people have the same issues that black people or women have. So mm -hmm. you can't make a very crass distinction here. Um, and we need to do what we can to get more uh, balance in terms of working class people and people from lower social economic groups into the mix. And so, you know, the whole thing is looked at in the round. But uh, when we have an absolute shortage of, of women or black people at the top, we've asked our headhunters to bring us a, a particularly diverse uh, group uh, sure. to the table. Mm. Yeah, I think that's important. And I think there's an educational piece, but also a spotlight piece that needs to happen here, which is you know, uh, there's not enough education around some of these topics in terms of, you know, I wasn't very educated in these topics before I started doing headhunting at exec level. And I think you have to go out and find the answers to stuff because actually, if you are male white like myself in this industry at the moment, you're worried about saying the wrong thing. And I think you've just got to say it as it is and then ask for forgiveness if you say the wrong thing. And I think that's the worry is that people so scared of saying the wrong thing, they say nothing. That's even worse, in my opinion. Oh, well, I, I agree. I agree. And we had a session at, um, at Nottingham Genesis about let's talk about race. And there were some people who were saying, oh, I don't talk about race. You know, I don't make any remark about someone being a black or brown person. I just don't bring it up at all. And I go, oh, well, you know, um, I always ask people, what's, you know, what's your ethnic background or where's your family from originally? And people go, oh, no, you're not allowed to ask that anymore. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I've been asking it all my life and I'm going to <laughs> carry on asking because I'm curious about people. And uh you know, nobody's ever taken offence when I ask because they know I'm not asking it in terms of go back where you came from, kind of. Of course. Yeah. yeah um, uh, and I, but I've put my foot in it loads of times, James. I've so people talked about, you know, my uh, partner and I've assumed they're the opposite sex or, you know, yeah. I've made mistake after mistake. And you've got, as you say, people are very quick to forgive you if you uh, do make mistakes like that. And obviously ones gets more and more cautious but you wouldn't want it to get in the way of just having a relationship with people at the end of the day so i mm. hope that um you know people whose name i pro pronounce it wrongly or i make an assumption um are prepared to forgive me and i hope they are yeah and i'm sure they are and, and that's the thing i think we live in a unfortunately in a world where you put something on social media or i put stuff on linkedin sometimes yeah. and and yeah you get you can get some quite bad comments back when you've not meant anything intentionally and it's come from a good place. And I think as long as we continue to live that way, we'll be fine. Yeah. Um, a couple of things on on Notting Hill. There's been a couple of um, mergers, acquisitions, like so, some parts of your journey. Can you just talk us through a couple of those? Because I, I think importantly, the Genesis one was was a big part milestone in the in the history. Yeah. How did that come about? What was the reasons and kind of what were the challenges in trying to put two businesses together? It's probably the most difficult thing I've ever done. Oh, really? Yeah. And it, I can't say it was fun either. It was quite hard work. It was really hard work emotionally as well as just time consuming and long hours and physically tiring. Um, so the rationale for it was simply that at that time, Notting Hill was like number 26 in the pecking order and Genesis about the same. We were about the same size. And I think although we were both part of G15, we were taking the view that um, times were getting tougher and the people who were bigger would get more opportunities, more influence, more work, would have greater financial strength and would be able to call the shots more than if you were a sort of middle ranking association. So that was the motivation if you like we also thought we would be able to build more homes and improve services for people that was like um, also part of the of the idea um and it came about because i was talking to the person who ran genesis at the time neil Haddon, and we said well you know let's have a go at doing this um 
it was really difficult because we were both the same size, about 25,000 each. And we wanted to do a merger of equals. And I don't think people had really done that before. They'd done it as an acquisition, one person kind of beating the other up into submission. And we really, really tried hard not to do that. Now, in reality, it's very, very difficult. And a lot of people in Genesis feel that Notting Hill was the winner. Um, and it it wasn't what we wanted, but quite often, like once we decided what the finance system was or the IT system, it would tend to tend to replicate a different uh, power structure perhaps than you might intend. Um, nevertheless, I think the, the process now, four or five years later, five years later, it settled down and everybody's okay and there isn't a division anymore and we are thoroughly integrated and mixed up with each other. And you wouldn't know what someone's okay. legacy background was, but it, it was really hard. And it, I wouldn't have chosen the timing either because we were more or less sort of two years of integration and then we had lockdown. And that meant that we weren't able to really sort of get the benefit of coming out of that. We stood still, you know, we were standing still in time for two years, really, yeah. uh, which sort of slowed it down. But I still think it was worthwhile. We became a sort of number five or six or seven in the pecking order. And um, we're now like a really big, strong organization. And um, perhaps both of us would be facing the financial difficulties of today in a weaker position if we hadn't done it. So, mm. but anybody who's thinking of it, listening to this and thinking of doing a merger, certainly in the housing association sector, it's really hard work. Yeah, and and you, don't, you don't get, you know, it doesn't have any output really. Doesn't that, <laughs> you know, it just takes a lot of time and effort. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot are looking at it. And that's why I mentioned it. I think, you know, strength in numbers feels like the mm. next chapter for me in terms of what housing associations need yeah. to come together yeah. um would you do it again if you if you went back to that place is it overall has it been a positive experience well it's intriguing because there are people now looking to come into a safe haven and there is a lot of you know the rent settlement has been very bad some housing associations have borrowed money at variable rates and that's really stinging them now hmm. so if your rents are held steady you're having to pay more for staff just because of inflation and you have to look after your people and then you're paying more for your money there are going to be a lot of associations in a weakened position and this will propel them towards a safe haven notting Hill genesis is a safe haven if people are looking for it but i think we haven't got a huge appetite at the moment okay. um and you know there will be there are others doing it and some are falling apart as you know but right now our idea is that we need to, as David Cameron used to say, you need to fix the roof when the sun is shining. We've got some money and we're going to use it to try and improve the housing stock. We're going to use our money to improve the environments that people live in, greening them and making the estates much more pleasant, but also to try to make sure that we can focus more on what the customer wants rather than what we think they want and that's quite a turnaround in our culture which you you know you were asking about before that's what we want to try and do to see the whole business through the lens of what's the experience of the customer like yeah. um and that's that's what we're involved in so that three-point plan if you like we're calling it better together is what the organization is currently focused on and we launched this about a year ago so even though i knew i wouldn't be here to see the end of it because it's probably a three to five year program uh, the board thought it was good to kick it off that was what they wanted so we've kicked it off and uh, our next chief executive sort of comes in with a clear agenda for him to deliver yeah and before we get on to that chapter because i want to talk about your mm. decision making and why and all that sort of stuff but one thing I wanted to mention is obviously that you were CB on the honor, Queen's Honours list. I mean, that must have been a proud moment for you and your family. Uh, absolutely. It was, well, you say the family. I didn't tell the family. I was so <laughs> sort of embarrassed and shocked, really. You know, I, I didn't feel like I really deserved it, but I was obviously thrilled. But I didn't tell anybody. My kids found out about it on LinkedIn, but my husband doesn't go on social media, so he didn't know. And um, I... 
took him out for dinner and I said, darling, I've got something to tell you. But I was smiling, so he didn't think it was really terrible. And he said, have you got an OBE? And I said, yeah, how did you guess? He said, oh, I was really hoping you'd get one. And he said, but I thought you might turn it down. I was, uh, I would be worried that you'd turn it down because he thinks I'm a bit of a lefty. So, um, and then he went quiet. He said, was it a CBE? I said, yeah, it was actually. So that was quite funny. And uh, yeah, of course, it's thrilling. I was very pleased because it was the Queen's Silver Jubilee. And obviously, um, I didn't expect she would be the one actually giving it to me. And, and sadly, she's she's died in the meantime. But, you know, what uh, a wonderful woman, what a role model uh, to keep working till two days before you die, you know, and to do it with such self-discipline and such commitment. I mean, it makes me, you know, talking about women leaders, she was and you know, still is an inspiration to mm-hmm. women. I think old older women in particular, but also as a young woman, you know, twenty one when she took the job on. So you feel she's shown people how to do it and how to do it well. No, oh, amazing! What a lovely sentiment. And, and yeah, uh, how does it come about? I mean, I'm, I'm actually quite fascinated. I mean, uh, how how did it come around, and how did you find out the news? Because clearly, it's it's a massive, massive achievement in anyone's career. But how does that come around as a Well, I I say to other people in the G15, it's a long service award. I mean, it might be you've been around for a long time. I mean, I have worked with quite a lot of politicians um, in in both the main parties. And so maybe, you know, when the department is looking at who has who has served in in this uh, area for a long time, I think they probably want more women and black people to get them. So that could Mm. help me. And um, you know, they take soundings from people who know you. So I don't, I don't know how it works um, no. exactly. So, but it's very nice. And I got, I got an email, and I got a letter in the post. And you have to say, will you accept it or not? So I ticked it straight away, and uh, and then you confirm your full name. So uh, that's it, really. And then it was announced, and it's very exciting. But I haven't been awarded it yet, so I haven't got the actual medal. Right because there's a backlog because of COVID. But one day I will be going to the palace with with a hat on, and I, I look forward to that day. Amazing. Um, and, 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 and you mentioned it, but obviously you've made the decision to, to step down from chief exec. What, what brought that about? Was there anything in particular, or is it just you feel like you've taken the business as far as you can? What, what was your decision-making process? Well, it, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because... There's lots of things at play, really a lot. And uh, people listening to this might be thinking, you know, is it time for me to do something different? And I never meant to do 18 years. I meant to do five, but it carried on and it was always, you know, interesting. Uh, Prior to that, I'd moved fairly frequently, three to five years in any job. I never stayed a long time, but it was really, we were doing new things, inventing new things. creating new products, building in new places and so on. That was always very stimulating. But And I'm not saying it's not still stimulating. I'm still quite intrigued about some of the things we're doing. I'd love to to follow through on work-wise. I'd love to follow through on the Better Together plan. But you do have to call it a day sometime and let somebody else have a go. I mean, this is another diversity point. If all the old people stay there at the top, the young people can never get the job. So there, there was an element of that. When I look at my own kids and they're being held back by old people sitting there at the top, it did it did talk to me. But um, it was during lockdown, I guess I got a bit more reflective and I think other people did. Yeah, the, that pace of being on a treadmill did slacken off a bit and you got more time to think what is life really about and I thought what I started doing was learning a language because I've never been any good at it and I was hopeless at languages at school and I thought this is something I'd like to have a go at so I started learning Spanish and I've got to the stage now where my Spanish is good enough for a simple chat but I know I want to go and live in Spain to to move from uh, you know, a, a sort of advanced beginner to to advance. That's what I'd like to do to get fluid and uh, fluent in it. So that's what I'd like to do next: to go and uh, live in in Spain and improve my languages. Yeah. 
Paul, oh, you've you've deserved that right, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Running an organization for that long. And like you say, you've kind of run two or three phases of an organization. I mean, I imagine if it had stayed the same for 18 years, maybe yeah. you wouldn't have done. Yeah. But it's kind of been a different organization all the way through that period. And what can you tell us about the the new CEO that's been appointed, Patrick Franco? I mean, don't know much about him. He's not from housing, is he specifically? But Big job That's for him. Right. That's right. I mean, he, uh, I, I wasn't actually involved in the process. I did meet him as part of the process, but the board uh, made the decision. Um, so I, when I spoke to him, he asked a lot of questions. So I spent most of the time talking. You see how, how easy it is for me to talk. So I haven't really got fully to grips with him. He's coming in tomorrow. I'm going to spend some time with him tomorrow. He's going to meet the executive team one by one to do some one-to-ones with him. But I mean, on uh, from what the board have told me, the guy is highly skilled and qualified. He's got experience working in banking and he's got experience working in the private rented sector, running that for Foxtons. Um, he's also extremely bright. I found him very, very quick when I spoke to him and also extremely charming very nice, uh, pleasant guy, a good listener. Um, I think they believe that his, you know, his values and his style uh, will contribute to the organization and bring something that perhaps we don't have already. So I know there are people who are a bit anxious about bringing people from outside the sector into the sector, but I think it has worked well in a number of cases and not so well in a number of cases. I mean, you don't know, but I think, you know, I trust the board I've worked with them for some of them for uh, 12 years and I believe they will have made a sensible decision. And Patrick will have a lot of fun because the organization is sort of uh, in a good place. It's a very, very good team around and it's uh, it's it's his now to it's his train set now. So yeah. I'm, I'll get out of it and let him get on with it. And when, and when is that? Just just out of interest. Like when's the his day? first formal day will be 1st of January, but it's a public okay. holiday, but it's fairly soon after that, yeah. Right, perfect. Um, and I suppose just for, for leaders around the sector, because people that listen to this will look up to you as a leader in our sector, if you were to roll up all 30 years of your career in the sector into a couple of insights for someone, what would they be? What would be the two things that you'd, you'd pass on and say, this is what we need to do, and there's some some ideas and insights that I've learned from 30 years in the sector? Okay, two two ideas. One is that housing associations are fascinating organisations because they are commercial companies with a social objective. So every decision you make is a commercial decision, but it's also a, a decision about communities, about customers, about social justice, about good places, about environmental. You know, every decision is two pronged and it's a paradox because if you want to make money, how can you do good? But you have to you have to keep those in play in every single decision. And everybody who works here has to be very cost conscious and aware or or thinking about making money as well as doing good and meeting the needs of our most vulnerable customers. So that's number one. It's it's fun and it's engaging, but it's also challenging. You've got two things to hold in mind all the time. And the second thing is, you know, pick the right people to do the job. And if you can get a great group of people around you, and quite a few headhunters have said, um, you know, I don't know what you're giving them there, but we find it very hard to pry them away from Notting Hill Genesis. <laughs> and it, it's true because people like it. You give them, they, it's their company. It belongs to them and they like it and they like the freedom that they have to, to contribute a lot of their own ideas. And um, it's quite a trusting environment and it's quite an honest place. It's not a political environment, you know, where there's a lot of backbiting and bitching behind the scenes. Yeah. People are as straightforward as they can be in a work a work situation. And I think the diversity angle helps with that because you know, it accepts that there's difference and difference, different views, different outlooks, you know, different religions, different neurodiversity, uh, different health status, different sexualities. All of this contributes to yeah, hopefully an understanding and accepting environment where people feel good about coming to work and being part of a, of a team. And all of that 
So those are the two things, yeah. Amazing. And the, and the final thing as we wrap up, and, and I could talk to you forever, um, but I mean, I know you've got other things on. What do you hope for the sector? I mean, I have two, I have two questions, actually. What do you hope for any, not in hell in the future? And what do you hope for the sector in the future? What, what do you want to see? If you look back in 10 years, what would you like to have happened in the sector in that period? Yeah, I'd like us to crack the customer service side of it to get mm -hmm. a situation where our tenants, instead of, you know, writing letters of complaint or going on ITV to show people the damp and mould in the house, where tenants rise up and say housing associations are marvellous, we'd like the government to fund them even more. Yeah. And we'd like them to be stronger and bigger and offer more to people. So I would like to get to a situation where our tenants speak so well of us that that really has an impact um and that's for the sector not just not for not, not just for notting hill genesis for notting hill genesis i hope that it it can be a beacon for those kind of things that we can be the best on customer service the best on diversity the best on technology the best on quality houses the best on environmental issues and to be the best housing association that's what i'd like it to be and i think it's got every every chance to be that um it won't be down to me but I hopefully i've given some you know uh built some foundations on which someone else can do that and i hope i hope that's achievable the times we're facing into are extremely tough james as you know you know there's yes, a lot of, a lot of issues out there the 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 cost of living crisis for our tenants the uh, difficulty of recruit recruiting good people uh paying a decent salary to our staff because they are also facing the cost of living getting the diversity thing right i mean that does make it a more challenging environment where you've got more issues all of these things um are, uh, politics is bonkers at the moment you know? <laughs> um the economy is, i think a recession is coming you know it's not easy times so it's going to need all the skills, intellect, drive, enthusiasm of the next generation to deliver these kind of objectives. But I do believe it can be done. Amazing. And what a lovely way to finish. And I just wanted to say for myself, but also for the listeners, like thank you for your modesty and for your service to what is an unbelievable organisation. I think you're quite a modest person, to be honest. I'm not, <laughs> arrogant and full of myself and i'm embarrassed about it but thank you that's so sweet and you're a, uh, it's really been an enjoyable conversation thank you for your interesting and insightful questions thank you james thank you very much cheers kate